Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. In the interest of brevity, I'll start at right at six o'clock. So my name is Ben Harrington. I am the Community Development Director for the city. Uh, that position entails overseeing the building department, housing, code enforcement, economic development. Um, and, and much more, essentially. It's kind of a catch-all position. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Mike Radzik, who is our uh, consultant for these types of matters. Uh, he's our program manager for the specific, excuse me, this specific ordinance. Uh, as well as with us tonight is Brent Strong from the same company, as, and then our inspector, Brandon Boggs. Uh, we also have our building department inspectors in the back, our building official, Steve Masiag, our building inspector, Jeff Feldkamp, um, and then also with uh, Carlisle Wortman, CES, is Stacy Kingsbury. Uh, who will be an administrator to help out with some of the paperwork involved in this process. Um, so the uh, rental inspection ordinance was adopted by the city council on October 17th, 2022. Um, and we're here tonight to explain to you as landlords what that means for you uh, and how this program will be uh, rolled out and administered. Uh, and without further ado, I'll kick it to Mike Radzik. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. I know you're all just overjoyed to be here, right? <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge that and I understand it. Um, I've done numerous programs of this nature in a variety of municipalities in Southeast Michigan. And I know that at times this can be a very contentious topic, especially for property owners who, who rent housing like yourselves. So first thing, I want to thank you for being uh, good landlords in the city of Saline and providing quality housing for the residents of the city. It's very much needed and you are very much needed and we appreciate everything that you do. What I'd like to accomplish tonight, and we're gonna to try to keep it to an hour, but we'll stay as long as necessary to get all your questions answered and all the information uh, out, is to give you a brief synopsis of how we got to this point today and then what you can expect from the city and its staff and we'd like to know also, hopefully with your feedback, what we can expect from you in return in terms of uh, registering your uh, rental property and then having it inspected and certified on an ongoing basis into the future. Um, with that, we have a uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'll use as a guide. Um, and uh, what, what do you recommend? Do you wanna take questions as we go or do you wanna hold them till the end? Just hold till the end. To hold them till the end, okay. Um, first of all, this is uh, kind of a um, chronological synopsis of the rental housing certification program. And for those of you that are interested, um, I can uh, be more than happy to either take your email address or provide you with mine and you can reach out. Be happy to send you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation as well as electronic copies of any of the other documents that have been provided today, okay? Um, it's a six step process and we are currently tonight in the beginning of step three, the landlord outreach. Um, it starts with legislative evaluation, which was done by the city council, legislative adoption of the ordinance and fee schedule, which was also already accomplished by the city council, the outreach to the landlords in the community to A, let you know about it and B, get you together and provide you with information our goal is to set you up to be successful, hopefully the first inspection through. Next would be property registration requirements, property inspection, and then the certification of the rental housing. Just some real quick data, and this is the same data that city council heard. Um, it is estimated that about one quarter of all the households in the city are rentals, approximately 24%. Is that a high number or a low number in your minds? Did you expect that? I think it's high. Um, for a city of this size, it might be a little bit high compared to some neighbors. It's certainly not as high as Ann Arbor. And just to throw it out there, Celine is not Ann Arbor and we're not going to run the property maintenance inspection program like Ann Arbor does. And that's not a slam on Ann Arbor, it's just a totally different philosophy of how to do business. I think you'll find this to be uh, reasonable and fair and equitable, that is our goal. Um, during the 2020 census, which was done just a couple of years ago, 913 of the households in the city self-reported to the Census Bureau that they were tenants renting. Uh, there are about 663 apartment dwelling units 
spread out among 10 complexes, according to the assessor's office. And uh, there are more than 300 single family homes that are claiming something less than 100% PRE, which is principal resident ex exemption. Some people refer to it as the homestead exemption. So the owners of those homes, for whatever reason, are claiming this is not my primary residence for the purpose of property tax exemption. Now, we will be the first to acknowledge to you all and to anyone that just because you're not claiming 100% doesn't mean it's a rental property. We're fully aware of that. There are many other circumstances that that could be true for. Could be your second home, could be one of numerous homes that you own uh, that are not rentals. Uh, you may have just chosen to claim the 100% exemption on another property that you own and leave this one alone for whatever reason that could be. So we want everyone to understand that we know that that's not always the case. And when we sent the letters out, we did send a letter to all the apartment complexes and to all the single family homes that were claiming less than 100%. But there was a huge highlighted caveat in that letter that I'm sure you saw that said, we know that not everybody that received this letter received it because it's actually a rental property. There could be some other reason why. And if that's the case, please contact us to discuss it so that we can remove you off the list if you're not subject to these regulations. And so we're currently in the process of talking with folks and collecting all that data. When we refer to single family homes for the purposes of enforcing this ordinance, that includes the single family houses in neighborhoods, the site condominiums, which for all practical purposes look like single family homes. Um, here in Saline, I know Northview Estates up on the north side of town is actually, that's a site condominium development. Those are all condos, not single family homes, but they look the same. It also includes um, attached condominiums that are, for lack of a better term, townhouses in a row, but they each have their own separate parcel ID number and they're all separately owned. And it also includes any manufactured mobile homes in the one mobile home park in the community that um, in those situations, the park, I think the Saline assessing record showed the park owned maybe 12 or 15 of those units that are likely being rented to folks. The rest, we assume and we'll find out for sure, are owner occupied by the people living in them, in which case they're not regulated under this ordinance. Here's just some quick rental data. We looked at um, the rents in the city. Um, this information is from an actual online survey of advertisements that were available online for homes and apartments that were available to rent here in the city of Saline. As you can see, uh, these are the averages for one, two, and three bedroom apartments and homes. I'm sorry, this slide is single family homes only. This slide shows the multifamily apartments uh, and the average rents for one, two, and three bedroom units. This information, let me go back real quick, the average single family home rent of 1959 and the average of all the apartment units will come into play a little bit later on when we look at the, what it's gonna cost you to comply. So we've done that math as well. This is just a quick look at how does Celine um, compare with its surrounding neighbors and throughout the state and the country as you can see, it might be a little hard to read, but the blue and the orange bars on the far left, the blue is the Celine advertised rents. The orange is uh, the analysis done by a nonprofit group called rentalsource.com that's available online. They've also, uh, they do annual uh, surveys of rents and what it is, and those are pretty comparable. The gray is Washtenaw County. The yellow is the state of Michigan, and the blue line on the far right is the United States. So as you can see, the average rents in Saline are considerably higher than they are in Washtenaw County, a lot higher than the state of Michigan average, and um, higher but not quite as high, more comparable to the average in the United States. That's just kind of a snapshot of the rents here in, in the city of Saline. Ordinance adoption, this is the second phase. The, legis the legislative evaluation by the council occurred. They took all this information and more into consideration. 
And just so you know, um, the public uh, debate and input took place over about a six month period from the very first conversation at a public council meeting to the point where there were two public readings to adopt the ordinance. And I think all told there were about five uh, open discussions at various meetings over a six month period before this, this ordinance was eventually adopted. Um, it establishes responsibilities and duties for landlords and tenants essential to make dwellings safe, sanitary, and fit for human habitation, provides for the registration of rental dwellings uh, with the community development department that Ben heads up, provides for the bi biennial property maintenance inspections, not biannual, biennial, which is once every two years. But as you'll see here in a little bit, there's an opportunity to earn a 12-month bonus so that it's three years instead of two. Um, it sets requirements for a certificate of compliance in order to occupy a rental structure and then designates penalties. These are not criminal penalties. These are civil. It's a civil, municipal civil infraction, much like a traffic ticket, if you will. In addition to adopting the ordinance, council updated its property maintenance code to the 2021 version of the International Property Maintenance Code. Does anyone here have any experience um, dealing with property maintenance code? No, okay. That's helpful to me to know because I'll, I'll um, take that into consideration as we talk through it. The, there's a group called the International Code Council. Uh, the acronym is ICC. The International Code Council um, is a national nonprofit organization that um, develops and publishes all the building codes, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, residential code, renovation codes, special codes for swimming pools and hot tubs and all kinds of accessory type dwellings and structures. And they also um, copyright and publish an international property maintenance code. The state of Michigan adopts the ICC building mechanical, electrical, plumbing codes from the ICC and some other organizations, and they make it their own with some customized changes. So the city of Saline building department with Mr. Masiak back there as the building official, um, he is enforcing and all of the city building department staff are enforcing state building codes. So when the state updates its code from, let's just say the 2012 edition to the 2020 edition, it automatically changes in the state, in the city of Saline and every other jurisdiction that, that enforces that state code. The property maintenance code and actually also the fire code are totally separate. They are not state codes. So they have to be adopted by the local government as a local ordinance. And that's what happened here. Uh, city council uh, determined that it was proper for them to adopt the 2021 version of the code, which is the most recent one. They usually update them every three years, so there won't be another one until 2024. And there were some special customized changes that they made to it to suit the particular circumstance here in the city of Saline, and we'll touch on what those are. The basic, the best way I can describe the property maintenance code is, if it's broken, then fix it and deferring maintenance over a long period of time can eventually and will eventually become a big problem, not only for you as the property owner, but for your tenants that are living in the place. Um, let me touch briefly on also what the property maintenance code is not. The property maintenance code is not the third bullet point, no blanket code upgrades. Our inspectors are not going to walk into your rental property. Let's just say it was built in 1946. They're not going to walk in and say, you have to upgrade all this plumbing, electrical, and mechanical systems to the current codes under state law. We're not doing that. That's not what this is. The best way I can describe it, and this is what helps me frame it in my mind, is whatever code it was approved under when it was originally built, unless you've upgraded for you know, renovations or whatever, you have to keep it in good, safe operating condition under the code that it was approved under when it was built. 
So if that structure is still under the 1940 whatever, the building code, you don't have to update anything, you just have to keep it in good condition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. It has to be maintained inside and outside as originally designed and approved when it was built. No blanket code upgrades. Now there are certain upgrades that would be triggered when you do, if you did a, a major renovation and, and Brent Strong is here, he's, he's the chief building official and the um, field manager for our consulting firm and um, he'd be able to answer any additional questions, but certain types of renovations and upgrades will require you to, to do these upgrades. Brent, can you just throw out one common example of if somebody does a, 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 some type of upgrade that's gonna trigger them to do everything? Uh, so if you put an addition on your house, and you know, the addition, as well as maybe the rest of the house that uh, you know, may be part of the renovation, then those current codes are going to kick in. And that's mainly, mainly you'll deal with the city of Saline's building department at that point. Um, but yeah, like, like Mr. Radzik said, we're here just to make sure what's there is safe and, and that it's functional for your tenants. Now there are certain mandatory safety improvements that you won't find necessarily in the state codes. Um, smoke alarms and CO2 alarms are the two major things. The 2021 property maintenance code, like its predecessor, the 2018 code, requires not only smoke alarms, but carbon monoxide alarms. Now carbon monoxide alarms can save lives, as I'm sure you know, um, and they're only required in homes where one of two conditions exist. I can uh, but in here for a second. So the city before adopting the 2021 International Property Maintenance Code had the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code. So this is already a code that the city has been enforcing uh, for numerous other issues. If your neighbor, for whatever reason, didn't mow their lawn for six weeks at a time and you called code enforcement, that's the code that we were using to enforce. So this isn't totally new. This is something that we've been doing on a more of a complaint-driven basis prior yes. to this. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> Carbon monoxide. Monoxide, I'm sorry. <laughs> Boy, I made a big mistake then. <laughs> and I'll own it. But both, both are bad. What, what is it supposed to be? What's the abbreviation? CO. Okay. My bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> Carbon monoxide. They can be combos. Yep, to save you, you know, some money or for convenience. So there's only two situations where you have to have the carbon monoxide detectors. If there's a fuel-fired appliance in the structure, like a natural gas-fired furnace or water heater, or if there's an attached garage where there's a passageway from the garage into the living portion of the home where car fumes could seep in, you have to have those alarms as well. So if you, have, uh, if you don't have fuel-fired appliances and you don't have the attached garage, you don't need CO2 alarms, okay? Just a point of, I'm sorry, CO alarms. Gosh, I gotta, I gotta get this right. Let's get off the slide so I get out of trouble. I think that John had a question. I'm sorry, go ahead. Firemen will tell you they're a very good idea because a small fire in a remote part of your home Yes. Yes, it's a really good idea. It's it's relatively inexpensive um, insurance. Uh, and then just as an aside, Council Member Dillon has a mic, so in the future when there are questions, we're going to try to get through most of it before we take back questions, but if you have any in the interim. Yeah. That was very timely. I appreciate that comment. Um, the rental housing certification code was adopted and made effective. Uh, it took effect November 5th of last year, following, as I said, six months of public discussion, two formal readings, and it's a phased implementation between 2023 and 2024. We'll get into the detail of that. The certification cycle, the standard certification cycle is 24 months, and there's an incentive bonus built into the code where you can earn an additional 12 months under certain circumstances, 
And we'd like to provide you with all the information that you need in order to achieve that, either your first time through or subsequent times through into the future. And as I said earlier, the city is inspecting, registering and inspecting and certifying all forms of rental housing. They didn't just decide, we're just gonna do apartments, we're just gonna do homes, we're just gonna do manufactured mobile homes. They're doing all forms of rental housing. Now, we'll get into a couple of the um, key points here that you need to know about. The code says, and this is, this is very common, other communities do this quite frequently, there is a section in there that talks about a responsible local agent for registration and inspection purposes. And just so you know, when you register and you provide your contact information, that information will also be made available to the city's police and fire department in the event there's ever some knock on wood, some serious emergency at three o'clock in the morning and they need to find the property owner that they'll have that information available. Um, if the owner of the property resides more than 50 miles from the city limits, the code requires the owner to designate a responsible local agent that our staff would deal with. The responsible local agent has to either live or have a place of business within 50 miles of the city. In most cases, now I will say, even if you live within 50 miles, you may live in the city itself. You can still designate someone else to manage your property and deal with the city and its staff for the purposes of certification. But if you live more than 50 miles away, you're required to designate someone. And on the form, the registration form, you'll see there is a place, if you are designating someone, either because you have to or because you just want to, that person also has to sign the form acknowledging and ex the acceptance of responsibility. And at that point, once that agent has been designated, the city will send all the correspondence to that agent. By default, the owner is the agent for our record keeping unless you designate someone different, okay? Um, of course, as you expect, there's a fee schedule that was also adopted by council that goes with this. The fees are designed and allocated to cover the costs of doing the inspections and the registrations. The registration fee is a one-time fee. Once you register, you don't have to re-register ever again unless or until ownership of the property changes. Then the new owner would have to re-register under their own name, whether it's an individual person or an LLC or some form of corporate ownership. And then there's recurring inspection fees for the every two year certification and renewal cycle, which we'll get into as well. If you have any doubt whether, is there anyone in here that uh, feels that they're going to have to designate a responsible agent because they live too far away? No, okay, good. Um, oh, no. I mean, you get a fine or no, 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 no. The purpose of the designated agent, which as I said, by default is the owner, unless you designate someone else. That's for us to have somebody that's designated responsible for the management of that property. So whether it's the owner or someone you designate, the scheduling notices, the invoices, the inspection reports, the certification, when there's code compliance, will all be sent to that designated agent. Well, you had mentioned that the police are gonna call you. That's just a public safety thing. Um, let's say there's, God forbid, there's a house fire and the fire department absolutely needs to get in touch with the owner. And maybe the tenant isn't available to be able to give them that information they'll be able to go to the city's records and look up, get a phone number, and try and contact somebody. That's all that is. Whether you answer the phone, that there's no requirement for that. It's just a public safety contact in the event of an extreme and emergency. Um, yes, yes. Are we allowed to, oh, are we allowed to designate the person who lives there? Because in my Ten. case, in my case, it's my niece. I only own it because, you know, she gets a place to live, and 
pays me very minimum rent and yes if you want to designate your if you want to designate your tenant I don't did everybody hear the question yep you can absolutely okay. Just know that that's who we'll be dealing with. Yep. Upon request, we will do our best. If, the, if you have an agent assigned and you want to get copied on everything, because for whatever reason you're not confident that your agent is going to keep you informed on an ongoing basis, we will, we will do our best to be able to do that, preferably by email, um, but we can't guarantee it. But we will sure try really hard to keep you informed. Hopefully the agent that you designate, you'll have that understanding with them. Yeah, yes, sir. So you'll basically be uh, uh, informing this agent every two years when the inspections do? Is that what it's all about? It's about all of it. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't see anything else where they'd be responsible. Well, if we go in and do an inspection and there's a laundry list of code yeah, violations. In two years, someone, someone responsible will receive a notice from the city that it's time to renew, time to schedule your renewal, and that's who we'll send it to unless you tell us different. What we're trying to avoid is a situation where it gets sent to someone and, oh gosh, that person changed a year ago and we didn't know and then you don't find out and now there's trouble. We, we want to avoid all that. When you do this through the email, is that what you do? So we, could, you, could you inform both the owner and the agent? We will do our best to do both, yes. Okay. Am I doing and some people right? have properties that they, they hire a management company to handle for them. So you're just saying, oh. I might own this property, but I, I've got this person over here that manages it for me, and I want them to deal with you know, going through all the, the certification process and all that. Okay. But it is in a lot of cases. Right, so if you're the owner of the property, sir, and you don't want to designate a responsible agent, then you are the responsible agent by default. That's how we're doing it. Correct. But yep. I just want to make sure that you would notify both the designated agent and the owner. Absolutely. If that's possible. We will do everything we can to make that happen, yes. Okay. Yep. Just as an example, in a different community that I used to work in, there was a gentleman who owned, I think, about 65 houses in, in the township. And he, he had someone on the payroll that did all this, and he said, G you just deal with this person. I don't ever want to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, so. Who gets the civil infraction, the designated agent or the owner? Great question. In a perfect world, it would be the owner, but the way the code is written, it could be either. And our goal is to never have to get to that point where we ever have to do that. And I, I'm... It's easier said than done. It is. It is in, in those rare cases when we just can't work together and cooperate to achieve code compliance in a reasonable period of time, um, then yeah, somebody might end up getting ticketed to appear in the district court. Um, but that is an absolute last resort that we try at all lengths to avoid if, if possible. What's a reasonable amount of time to fix a violation? We'll get to that. And if I don't answer it sufficiently, bring it up again, but I think we'll answer your question. And this, in the effort of time, mm -hmm. we're going to sort of pause on questions at this point so we can get through the presentation because we are almost at the 630 mark. Perfect, thank you. Real quick, in terms of costs, um, this information is based solely on the average rent data that was collected from that nonprofit group and from the online advertisements we know that these are not the actual average rents for every rental property in the city. But the top section there, single family homes, for your first, you see where it says monthly cost, first cycle in registration, monthly cost, subsequent cycles. The first cycle would include your registration fee. The subsequent cycles would not include the registration fee because it was already picked up. So based on this, based on, um, an average rent of 1959 a month for a single family home. It's going to cost for the first two year cycle, including registration, about $12.92 a month. And after that, $8.75 a month, which is give or take about half a percent of the monthly rent. For apartment units, it's different. This example here um, is a one apartment building with eight apartment units, 
three accessory facilities, which would be things like mechanical rooms, boiler rooms, laundry rooms. And it includes one reinspection having to come back at least once, God bless, for every single thing that we inspected. So it includes 12 reinspection fees. That boils down to $9.40 the first cycle and $8.62 thereafter, which is slightly over half a percent of the monthly rent. Now, we understand that this is going to differ, but um, having done this several times, one of the big questions is, well, what is this going to cost me as the landlord? And, you know, am I going to have to raise rent for my tenant? You may, you may not. It, that's your choice. But if you do, we wanted to give you some type of preview on what that might look like. Property maintenance code inspection categories. Um, let me see here. So these are the general categories. And one of the handouts back there, I hope you grabbed them all, the one that's got the checklist on the front page, and then there's about 20 pages of code behind it. This is chapters, what you have in your hand is chapters three, four, five, six, and seven of the property maintenance code. And those are the meat and potatoes that would apply to you guys. It skips the administrative chapter and the references, and there's standards in there for board ups for a vacant house or a fire damaged house, which aren't in play here. But these are the general categories. There's general requirements that include structural uh, integrity of the home, and inside and out, uh, lighting, ventilation, occupancy limits, plumbing and fixtures, mechanical, electrical, and then fire safety. And you have the entirety of those chapters in your hands. The one-time fee for single-family homes is $100. As I said, that includes detached site condos and detached condos. It would also include manufactured mobile homes. Duplexes, one registration for a duplex structure. Um, it's $125, includes both, both sections. If there, anyone here has a uh, owner-occupied duplex where the owner lives in one portion of it and rents out the other, uh, this would also, uh, same thing would apply, but the inspection fees are different. Multifamily apartment complexes, each building, regardless of how many units, it could be five units, it could be 20 units in a building. Each building gets registered separately, and you would provide all the information about how many units are in there and how many laundry rooms, mechanical rooms, uh, boiler, if there's a boiler, that type of thing. The recurring inspection fees are here. Um, for a single family home, it's 150. That includes inside and out. For duplexes, it's $75 for the exterior. And when we say exterior, it's the outside of the structure for code violations and the grounds. The grass, if there's a shed, you know, the, all, everything for blight. And then it's $75 for each interior. Now, if you do the math, you'll find out that the exterior and one interior cost-wise is the same as a single-family house. So there you tack on the second interior. And then for multifamily, are there anyone here representing any of the apartment communities? Couple, okay. For multifamily, it's $125 per building. That includes inside and out, including the grounds, carports, those types of things. And then there's a fee for each individual unit and then each accessory facility, which again is things like laundry rooms, mechanical rooms, so on and so forth. Any type of reinspection where the inspector has to come back to verify compliance with the code for any repair or correction that was made is $60. It doesn't matter what they're going back to look at. It's the same. As I said earlier, um, Fuel-fired appliances, if they're present, require a carbon monoxide detector. Got it right. Um, however, the code also requires a licensed mechanical contractor has to take a look at anything that has a heat exchanger or a flu exhaust vent like a hot water heater. The reason is, and we have the benefit, Brandon here is our housing inspector. He's also a state registered and licensed mechanical inspector. but. Um, the housing inspector doesn't have the credentials necessarily to determine whether that heat exchanger is cracked and could be leaking carbon monoxide into the home. The same with the flu exhaust vent system. 
So we do require, if you have something like that in the structure, we require a licensed mechanical inspector to take a look at it and certify in writing that they've looked at it and they have determined under their licensing through the state that it is safe at the time that they were there. There's a late cancellation fee and a lockout no-show fee. We try our best to work with folks. Um, we ask that you give us 72 hours notice if you have to cancel late, but we know that life happens and sometimes there's mitigating circumstances and I can tell you we will bend over backwards to work with you and avoid charging extra fees if at all possible. The lockout no-show is simply this. There's a scheduled appointment and by the way, this is not like Comcast where we say we're going to show up between 8 a.m. and noon on a given day. We have an exact appointment time, a date and a time. If we show up and we'll, in general, they'll wait about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. If we show up and no one is there to facilitate the inspection, the um, responsible local agent or owner, whichever the case may be, just isn't there. Or if the tenant's designated and they're just not there or you know, we're ringing the bell and knocking, nobody's answering, we'll give it as much time as possible and then we'll leave. But the reality is we've set aside an hour of that inspector's time to do the inspection and to write the reports up afterwards. And there's a fee, obviously, if, if that happens. Tenant complaints. You'll have, you'll be given, yeah, great question. So I think uh, you'll be, he will liberally share his cell phone numbers. If for some reason he's running late, he's, we'll do everything in our power to reach out and let you know. And if we're running so late that it's not going to work for you, we'll, we'll just reschedule it when it is good for you and there won't obviously be any cost. But I can tell you that in rare occasions that ever has happened in, in years. We always try to be there when we say we're going to be there. And if there's ever a problem with that, please reach out and talk with myself or Ben or someone else in charge. Tenant complaints, I just want to address this real quick. There is a fee, it's $75. This is when a tenant calls and says, I've got X, Y, and Z problems. Now, the policy is we will generally require some type of reasonable proof from the tenant that they have notified you in writing of their grievances and that you have not responded or taken care of it in a reasonable period of time. What the average person would consider to be a reasonable period of time. Um, and if we end up, if they provide that to, you, to us and they represent that that's the case and we go, if we go there and we find legitimate code violations and reasonable evidence that there was notification and nothing was done, then you'll get the bill. If we go there and there aren't any code violations, they get the bill. So that's kind of an effort to, I, I know how this goes. Where I used to work, our building was attached to the district court and Every Thursday after landlord tenant court, there'd be a slew of tenants coming over wanting to file complaints because they were getting evicted for some reason. And so we put this policy in place and it does work. It, it eliminates a lot of the, for lack of a better term, frivolous or BS types of complaints that are not based in fact. It's just a maneuver to get out from under some other circumstance. So we're, we're always gonna try to be fair and equitable in our treatment of you and of the tenant. Um, oh, very important at the end, at the bottom there, the inspection fees have to be paid prior to the inspection date. We ask you to do that. You'll always have plenty of opportunity in advance to take care of that. The city has a variety of methods that you can pay um, and uh, we'll give you reminders as necessary. The property maintenance code, these are the chapters. This, if you've ever looked at a building code book, they're pretty thick, like a phone book almost. This is the slimmest, thinnest code book you'll ever see. It's, there's only eight chapters plus the appendixes and the ones in blue, three through seven are the meat and potatoes and that's what you have in your hands. You have the entirety of those chapters. This is a summary of chapter three, the general requirements. I'm not gonna go through each one because you can read them all and there's a couple of photographs of, of obvious code violations. Obviously there's a, a deck that 
didn't withstand the load of people standing on it because it wasn't attached properly. And obviously the top one is exterior problem with weeds or grass or what have you. But these are all the types of things they'll be looking at. And Brandon and Brent are here, and we can get into your questions on any kind of specifics before we, we leave tonight. Chapter 4 is light ventilation occupancy limits. Um, this is a classic example of a, a bathroom, I guess it's a, an exhaust fan. I always call it a fart fan. I apologize. <laughs> the fan in the bathroom, it's supposed to, it can't just be vented into the attic like it's depicted in this photograph because that's a code violation. You, you let that go on long enough and you're going to be full of mold and then you're going to have way more problems than you had before. The same with occupancy limits. I don't expect we'll have any issue with that here in Celine, but there are limits in the code and it's, it has to do with square footage and egress and number of bathrooms and so on and so forth. Chapter five is plumbing facilities and fixtures. Deals with what's required, the toilet rooms, the plumbing mm -hmm. systems, the water systems, sanitary drainage and storm drainage. Here's some classic photographs. What do you think of this one on the far right? Hopefully nobody's got a door with a notch cut out to open up around the toilet. That's a problem. Um, I will, just a quick note on storm drainage. For some of the older homes, this may come into play, and I'll mention it so you have an opportunity to check way in advance. Some pumps are not allowed to be connected to the sanitary sewer that's being sent for sewage treatment. That's a, that's a really big no-no. DPW has rules about that. Every community has rules that prohibit that. Unfortunately, it, it gets hooked up that way. Sometimes it used to be pretty prevalent way back when, not so much anymore, but if in doubt, you might take the opportunity to check and correct that long before we ever get there. Mechanical electrical requirements, um, heating facilities, mechanical equipment, which would include water heaters, furnaces, electrical, um, the ductwork. Anybody have any elevators, escalators, or dumbwaiters? Okay, good. Elevators are actually under state of Michigan jurisdiction. So, just some common examples. Any kind of a outlet or light switch that doesn't have a cover with exposed wiring is a code violation, easily remedied. Um, that's an example of a water heater duct system that's improperly installed. It's canted or slanted downward, which means that gas isn't escaping the way it's supposed to. And hopefully you're not, no one's had tuna fish cans for an electrical junction box. But the, these are actual inspection photographs. And then finally, the fire safety requirements, uh, means of egress, fire rating, uh, fire protection, carbon monoxide alarms and detection. Carbon monoxide can't be seen, smelled, or heard, but you can stop it with the alarms. Um, real brief mention of means of egress, it's in the fire code and it's commonly called a fire load violation. If any of you have tenants that you suspect or know are, for lack of a better term, hoarders, we are not regulating or judging bad housekeeping. The place could be an absolute shambles and it doesn't rise to the level of being a code violation unless there's not a clear path of egress in and out of the place. And the reason it's in the fire code is a house like that, um, and I was gonna put a picture in that depicts it, but I chose not to, because in most cases it's a symptom of mental illness and I just didn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, the fire department, they get a rescue call and they have to, I, I've been, I used to work for Ypsilanti Township for a very long time. And I saw a video and fire or photographs where firefighters had to go in and literally crawl up on top of junk that was taller than them, where their, their head is scraping the ceiling, trying to crawl from room to room to rescue someone having a medical emergency somewhere in the house. That is an, an extreme example of a fire load problem. So if you think any of your tenants might even come close, you might have that conversation with them. And that's why that's in here. It's very, very important. By the way, if you ever encounter a tenant in this situation, there are free resources available in Washtenaw County. 
There is a hoarders task force. Um, they are very much in tune with this and they are very, very uh, ready, willing, and able to respond, deal directly with your tenant, provide them free resources and help them remedy the problem at no cost to you. And if you ever run into that situation, I'll be more than happy to connect you with the right folks. Or we will do it for you, either way. Property certification is the last step. Um, once, um, once all the repairs have been made and someone asked the question about how long do you get, life safety code violations where, where it could jeopardize someone's life or the safety of the structure in terms of a fire hazard maybe or a raw sewage backup hazard is generally seven days or possibly less depending on how dangerous the situation could be. Non-life safety, which is everything else, generally speaking, 28 days, which is four weeks. So if we're here tonight, if we come and do your inspection today, you may say, all right, four weeks from today on a Thursday, we'll be back 28 days later. If you need more time, and there's legitimate reasons why, we know there's supply problems right now for various things. You just can't get a hold of the part or whatever the case may be. You have a death in the family and it's not life safety. We will work with you and give you extensions as long as you're making an effort and we're all on the same page. Okay. Um, the reinspection is simply to verify that what was cited previously has been corrected. No inspector, unless it was some egregious Calamity. No inspector should walk in to do a reinspection and suddenly say, oh, yeah, well, the first time here I forgot about X, Y, and Z and nail you again. We're, that's not going to happen. That should never, ever happen. And we drill it into our, our staff's heads that one of the most important things, I think, from your perspective is consistency. Regardless of who shows up to do that inspection, the results should be approximately the same. And when they come back to do the reinspection, they're only looking at what was cited the first time, not at everything else. Okay? So you can, you can count on that happening with our staff. Um, once we come back the first time for the first reinspection, hopefully everything that was cited has been corrected. If for some reason it hasn't been or it hasn't been done properly, we'll have to come back a second time. We hate to do that. Hopefully that will never ever happen because it's completely unnecessary if there's been good communication from us to you. So if you ever find yourself in doubt, um, please get in touch with myself or Ben and we will look into it and make it right. Okay. Um, oops, so quick, I know we're running short. Uh, once code compliance has been verified, all the fees have been paid, then uh, we issue the certificate of compliance it starts, the two-year cycle, or the three-year cycle, if you've earned that bonus, starts on the date of the initial very first inspection and runs two or three years from then. The reason we do it that way is because there's been situations in the past in other places where there's been a series of cancellations and then reinspection and, oh, I haven't got it done yet. And, one thing leads to another and it's eight, 10 months later, they finally come into compliance. We're not, we're not going to give away the eight or 10 months for no good reason. So it starts from the very first day that we come in and do the inspection and runs forward from there. Unless, like I said earlier, there's some mitigating circumstance that we will definitely take into account for your benefit. Um, the standard 24 month certificate period is what it is. The 12 month incentive bonus, it shall, the code says it shall be granted. That's a shall, not a may, which means it's mandatory for us. If there's no life safety code violations on the initial inspection, which is very important, if there's no more than four non life safety violations, if everything's been corrected by the first reinspection, the first time we come back, and you don't owe any fees, fines, or delinquencies to the city for any reason, um, you will be able to earn that extra 12 months and make it a three-year cycle instead of a two. We tried to make it achievable, especially there was a lot of debate over the four non-life safety. A lot of people said it should be less, but this is where we landed, and I feel very comfortable with that. I would also tell you, and the inspectors would too, certain types of things that are common. Um, if you have the kind of smoke detectors that take regular batteries, 
Does anyone ever have a tenant that just takes them for toys, kids' toys, or it's there, but there's no battery. So it would we encourage landlords when we show up have some extra batteries in a pouch with you because if you can take care of it right then and there, it's not going to get cited. So just think in your mind about what those common things are and come prepared because it'll make it a lot easier for everyone involved. Um, and that's that's the entirety of the presentation. So with that, we'll take, I know there's probably a lot of questions, and if there's any questions about specific portions of code that you're worried about, we have the people here that can answer that for you. Please make sure you talk in the mic and wait for the mic to come to you to ask questions, please. Thank you. Side of the room and work my way back over. <coughs> There were hands up. I apologize, I have many questions. Um, first off, the uh, inspections that we're supposed to have, you had mentioned that with mechanics such as a gas furnace, uh, that there would have to be a certif certification. Is that something that we have to provide to you? So we have to hire a different inspector to come out, HVAC contractor? Yes. Okay. You need you need to hire a licensed mechanic. It's typically a mechanical contractor. Brent is the well. Brent and Steve Maciak. Steve is the city's building official. Brent's our in-house expert, and he is a building official in some of the other communities that we work in. So I would bow to their not their reasonableness on this stuff. Yeah, and we can, uh, we'll work with the city's building official, but generally, if you've had a new appliance installed within five years, we, you know, we would not require a, a certification. Yep, exactly. It's mostly intended for the older things that have been there a while. Yep. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, next is in a, in a condominium community, uh, some of the exterior is not necessarily handled by the, the homeowner. Yes. Um, in that instance, let's say you call out a crack in the sidewalk or an uneven sidewalk as a safety hazard. And the, do you by chance work with the association to have that repaired or is that something that you rely on the owner to do? If it's not the owner's responsibility, the owner won't get cited for it as part of the rental inspection. If it's the HOA or uh, maintenance company for the, the development, um, we will either communicate with them or we'll refer it to the city's code enforcement to deal with directly with whoever it is that is responsible. Okay. Right, in that specific instance, ma'am, the city's building department and myself would be responsible for making sure, if it's not the owner's responsibility, yeah. uh, okay. because there are various other tools that we have, such as site plans, that would then indicate that that item needs to be repaired. So it would be the HOA's responsibility, not the individual's. Okay, perfect. And then my, we'll say my final question for now. Um, I was a real estate agent for an investor, and she owns two properties in Slane. Um, I am not a property manager. She lives in California. Mm -hmm. I don't get paid to be her designated agent. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I, do, I am familiar with her tenants, and I allow them to call me should anything go wrong, and I do handle, call the plumber, call the electrician, call okay. whoever needs to be called. Gotcha. And I do handle that for her. Um, but I in no way, shape, or form want the invoices. I in no way, shape, or form want to be notified every time something needs to happen. I want her to have that. I, I, I am considered her designated agent, but I do not want the liability of any civil infraction. Um, and, and so how do we get around that? Well, if that's the case, I would urge you not to accept that responsibility, and it would be on her to designate someone to do that. Uh, and then if I can go back, I know Mr. Randazzo had a, a comment about it earlier. It, it's almost always going to be the city's choice to cite the property owner and not the responsible agent. Uh, it, that's how we've operated with multifamily complexes in the past. You know, we're not finding the individual property manager. We're usually finally finding the NLLC that it operates under. For purposes, for single family homes, it's a request to provide that information to give the community development department a snapshot in time of what it looks like and they could then, Ben could address it more, but there's other things that they could use that information for to help 
benefit the city in other ways? Yeah, absolutely. So for example, I get data every month from the Ann Arbor Realtors Association that shows uh, the price, uh, how long homes are on the market, uh, comparative to Dexter, Chelsea, Milan, and then we have some that go further out. It's really just for us to understand what is the affordability and attainability of our community. Um, but if it's not something that single family homes feel comfortable providing, you can just write NA, but it, none of the information would ever be shared. It's just simply for us to, to create an average to kind of figure out what is the, the cost of living in Saline. Are the fees, are any fees No, 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 the, not, the, not at all. It's all inspection based. Whether it's, that information is provided or not, the fees are the same. One more question. And nobody's gonna call IRS. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have one more question. What started all this? Yeah, absolutely, and there's some council members. So this process actually started before I started with the city, so I started last May. Um, but there had been a number of, of longer lasting complaints that we had from tenants at various rental properties about the state of disrepair at some of these. Um, it's also a, kind of a, an accepted aspect that, that tenants don't have the same rights. It's often difficult to contest issues uh, without going to court. Usually if people are renting too, it means they might not have access to, to legal fees if there is a, is a larger issue. So it's meant to be a proactive approach to make sure that everyone in Saline, regardless if you're a renter or a buyer, has a safe and habitable place to live. Right, so it, it had previously been a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but it, it called, it requires a call, and then we go through the whole complaint process. It's similar to the tenant complaint process, which takes quite a bit of time, but tenants often fear retaliation as well from landlords, and I'm not saying that any of you in this room are, are guilty of, of, of anything like that, but we also don't have the legal capacity to discriminate and say, well, we're only gonna do this against this one specific property, or we're only gonna do it against this one specific property. You can't selectively apply laws in that manner, so it's a very common policy that many other cities have adopted, including Milan, uh, as well as many other cities in Washtenaw County. Yeah, but this absolutely penalizes people that completely take care of their property. Everybody does. You gave us a, st a statistic of 25% of Celine homes are uh, rentals. How much of those are blight or deteriorated or falling apart? I think we'll be, I think we'll be finding out. Right. No, I mean, based on, based on the information that you have now and the calls that you have go gone to, what's the percentage of those that are, that are in disrepair? I don't, I don't have access to that data, so I can't answer that question. I don't know. That's relevant information to start charging every single renter in the city of Saline. That's correct. You cannot charge, you cannot implement this without that kind of information. Well, hang on. Hang on, let me back up just a and, second. And, and, and forgive me, but maybe I, I feel a little silly here, but the first that I found out about this was a week and a half ago. I didn't know anything about this in October. Well, I'm sorry for that, but it went through all of the required public disclosures when council. So I just want to. Can we, we need, okay, I, yep. we just need to speak one at a time so that we are able to. We have quite a few questions. We have online questions, so we're going to need to keep moving through. There will be time. You can have email addresses for our contacts, and we can continue the conversation. Yeah. 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 So also, I, I already pay over seven thousand dollars a year in taxes. To the city of Slate, that's one third and of our rent check. As a third of the rent check every single month that it's goes to Celine. And my my margins on profit are, are very thin. I understand that. These, so, as far as I'm concerned, these fees, as low as you think they are, unreasonable. Well, unfortunately, the time to have this debate and discussion would have been at the time City Council was doing their due diligence. The city never sent anything out. If they did, mm -hmm. I beg everybody to go back and look at that tape recording and see what you guys said. Okay, we're moving on to our next question. So, Thank you. So the legislative, the legislative process to adopt this has already occurred. 
And the purpose, the purpose of tonight is to give you information about the process, the inspections, and what to expect. Now, the purpose of tonight is to hear from the people that own these properties. And this is relevant information. That's well, I, all have to take this into account. I would hope that you can appreciate that tonight we are not in a position to undo the legislative adoption decisions that have already been made. That's not going to happen tonight. <laughs> yes, we released, received one of your letters from the city, and our property is not a rental. My daughter, my wife, and my mm -hmm. we own the property, and she lives there. Mm -hmm. And I can't see why we uh, we got the letter. It's not so there was there was a section near the bottom of the letter that was highlighted in yellow that said. It, well, at first it explained why the letters were sent out to single family homes that were not claiming the homestead exemption. And then it also said, if you receive this in error, and this is not a rental property, please contact us to discuss okay. it I, I just, and, and get removed from the rental list. Sir, if you follow up with me after, we can yeah. have that discussion. And I can tell you, I've had conversations with a couple of different people already where it is their home and it's, they're not claiming the exemption and they were unaware. And so they now are informed and have an opportunity to change that and lower their tax bill. Yes, yeah, sorry, we just got this last week. So I just wanted the specific contact information to be able to see who we can clear this up with if. Yeah, I'll get you now. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank sure. you. And then if we're not um, excluded, are, like, do we still only have, you know, whatever until next, what is it? The 13th? The 13th? Like, you said you're clearing this up but i just wondered is that going to be like you know we get like the 12th we find out oh you're not exempt and then you know what i mean we'll work with you with time okay thank you what if my tenant doesn't want an inspection great question in the state of michigan tenants do have a right to refuse entry for this you have an obligation under the ordinance to inform them of the date and time of the inspection they have a right to be there present if they wish, and in most cases, most tenants, if they're in a position where they can be there at that appointed appointment time, they do want to be there. And frankly, we encourage the tenant to be present because we'd like to ask them, is there anything that you want us to look at? And as our inspector moves from one room to another, it's better for us to have the tenant present to, to view all of this. We will never go in there without um, a responsible local agent whether that's the owner, their designated person, or in your case, maybe if you designate the tenant, then that's the way it would have to be. Um, now, if they refuse, um, there is a remedy in the code, and the remedy is um, the city would speak with its attorney, its prosecuting attorney, and the city could very easily write a application to the court to grant for lack of a better term, an administrative uh, warrant to go there and do the inspection. That is an extreme circumstance. Um, been doing this kind of thing now for 20 years or so. Never had that happen with a tenant. I have had tenants before marijuana became recreationally legal. I had, we had a lot of tenants that said, gosh, I don't want you in. But when we said, well, why? Well, because you know, I got this growing and I got that. I said, well, that's not what we're here. We're not the police. We're not here to look at that stuff. Here's what we are here for. And we're here regarding the condition of the property for your benefit, as well as for the owner of the property. So in most cases, we can talk through it. But if push comes to shove, that's what would happen. Well, so I've had the same, one rental, same mm -hmm. tenant for six years. The only tenant that's ever been in there, they call, we fix it. They're very happy, so I can easily see them saying, I don't need or want somebody else mm -hmm. inspecting my property. Um, and so I need to let them know that they actually have rights. They do, they absolutely do. And there is, there is a process set in law on how that's to be dealt with. Just curious from your experience, uh, yeah. how this was rolled out, I'm usually not what's going on, and this one did sneak up on me. I'm sorry. How this was rolled out, the six uh -huh. months you talked about prior, that none of us seem to know about. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been, in your experience, any legal action to suspend this type of an activity and review that process? Mm -hmm. 
I'm not personally aware of any. That's not to say there never was. Okay. Um, the topic was raised. Uh, there was robust conversation at numerous council meetings. There was at least two public readings of the ordinance that were published in the whatever the local publication is that's required by law. And all the meetings were televised and available online. So I, they went, I know the city went through its normal okay. process that's required under state law to notice you, people. Obviously, I mm -hmm. Got it. That out to the non I don't know, but I can tell you there were there were landlords that showed up, and I think maybe at, at least a couple of tenants at some of the meetings. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. well, they're doing it, it may not be necessary, and we're just mm -hmm. isn't necessary. Thank you. Yeah, as far as the information on this meeting, we got these, you know, and we're here. Mm -hmm. Just because I have a rental in Celine doesn't mean I live in Celine. So I don't see anything on the TV. You know, I'm, I'm in another county, but I'm within 50, 50 miles. And we structure our rents based on an application that someone gives me. And if they don't make $200,000, I can't charge them a high rent. We have higher liability of insurance. You already know this. We don't play, pay any homestead. We have no homestead credit. We pay higher in insurance and we pay our bills and we fix everything that they want. We can only take so much from someone that has so much money. There's a rental group that rents for a reason. They might not be able to save down payments for a house and stuff. And so we're here to assist why are they more important than the 75% of other homes that might have the tuna can for their, for their um, electrical? Why are my people more important than the other citizens? Why isn't every, I mean, if we're doing this, why, why can't every home be looked at the way you're, and, and charged the way we're charged? So the International Property Maintenance Code does apply to every single home in the city, and it has for quite some time. So like I said earlier, whenever there's a complaint about code enforcement, we're using the exact same code against specific homeowners as we are in this specific instance here. But as I mentioned earlier, that this ordinance was not adopted out of the blue. It was really based off of a lot of the pattern of complaints, a pattern of behavior from specific landlords and from rental properties in general and tenant complaints that my department had received, that the city council had received via citizen comments and emails. based on the volume of complaints and the gravity of the complaints that this ordinance was chosen to adopt. I think it's fair also just to Thank you. Mention. I'm going to get up here so you all can see me. Yeah. My, my name is Sal Rand. I live in the city of Saline. I've been a 35-year resident, and I'm happy to see some of you here that have a little patriotic spunk in you. Um, you know, the saying, government, uh, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, right? Uh, I, you know, honestly, the question I'd like to know is how are you going to manage this complexity as a city government when you can't even pick up the leaves on my street on a timely basis? You can't even take care of the water treatment plant or give me clean water. So I'm not, no, I'm... Sure, okay. I'm happy to do that. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is actually... Uh, a government takeover of your private property. I mean, it's they've included everything, not only commercial apartments, but individual homes. I mean, they're only one step from coming into everybody's home. So I was here at the previous meetings, and the way these things work in this council is the council's captured by the, by the administrative staff, and it didn't matter if you were here and you complained or gave your complaints for it. This was coming through anyway. So what I would like to suggest
just to a bunch of you. Some of you may be okay with all this. I'm personally not. But if you're not, I think this is already a done deal. It's, it's, it's a code here in Celine. And I've been here for 35 years, and the code's gradually gotten bigger and bigger. And if you read it, you say there's no way a majority of people would vote for this stuff. There's just no way. So what we can do is get a proposal on the ballot for the next voting cycle where we can vote this down collectively. Because you all are liable if you're negligent. If you have a cracked furnace and you're negligent and, and somebody is injured in your property, you're not only maybe civilly liable, you might be criminally liable. So you've got liability. You don't need all this stuff now going in in your private properties telling you what to do. They can't even take care of themselves. We need less pencil pushers and paper pushers and more broom pushers in this town. Thank you. My name is Dave Jeb. Um, <clears throat> I think this is bad law, and I think uh, it was a mistake. There's a much easier way to, to get the job starting a whole new tax revenue for the city. As everybody agrees, we pay way too much taxes already. We have inflation. Our tenants are hurting. And I've been a landlord for over 25 years. My tenant calls me and says, Dave, I've got my smoke alarm. It's not working. It's replaced. I take care of my tenants. I don't need the city to take care of them. My tenants wouldn't want to stay in my property if there was a guy that didn't care about them or wanted to fix it up. So I think this is bad. And the fact that you're going to just impose this on everybody without us even knowing about it is a travesty. Now, it would seem to me if you had just that one section that said, tenants, call the city if you've got a complaint because your landlord's not taking care of you. The city could call me up and say, we've got a complaint. We'll take care of it. Look, all of our buildings were inspected by the city. We bought them, or when they were so built, they were all inspected. So there's probably no real major catastrophic issue that needs to be addressed. But I'm just saying, this is a travesty. It's, it, I can't believe it. I'm falling out of love with the city of Saline just because we're being taxed to death. And if you look around here, most of these people in this room are my senior citizens. We're already on a fixed income. And, you know, we, we worked our lives to have one investment property. And now we've got the city coming in and saying, this, every two years you're going to pay us more money. We're going to do more inspections. This is BS. I'm sorry. But thank you for your... Just a reminder, please be mindful and do not speak while others are speaking. I think this is very discriminating against people against renters, and actually it's going to cause more inflation when these people have to, the landlord's not going to make the pay for this stuff, the renters are going to pay for it. And if I remember right, watching the movie, this is exactly how Nazi Germany started. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to move. We've got some online questions at this time. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, I got a question. Why don't you have a family for us but you want to rent your basement out? Um, so the city is actually currently considering an accessory dwelling unit ordinance. I guess I'm not sure how the basement would specifically apply in this specific instance, uh, but the accessory dwelling unit would then permit uh, you know, accessory dwellings, so either in a basement, uh, a converted Either garage, things all. like that. So Ann Arbor currently has an ADU ordinance, as does Dexter. Um, but I, I can connect with you after this sort of go over that specific case. PowerPoint? Yes. yes. The, the PowerPoint and this entire meeting are all being put on our website. So you'll be able to see the PowerPoint as well as the recording of this meeting. Uh, yep, yeah, and I'll put my contact information as well as Mr. Radzik's on that same page. So you feel free to send us any emails. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to uh, relay that uh, really in Celine, affordable housing is rental property. And all your fees plus all the landlord's fees to meet you and inspect and carry out this is all going on the renters. Uh, so affordable housing is taking a big hit in Saline because not only are the inspection costs applied to the future uh, rents, but all the repairs are going to be paid for by the renters. 
The renters in Saline are paying for all of this. The landlords are just going to pass it on because statements were made that the uh, it would the your your fees would not impact taxpayers, and that's true because the landlords are taxpayers, and they're going to pass every fee you pass on to them to the renters. So you've you've really driven a nail in the coffin of affordable housing. Um, the I believe the mayor pointed out that very few landlords had a problem. It was a minor problem, but it's being dealt with. Now 95% of property owners with no problem are having to pay for a 5% problem. So um, I can see why people are upset over this. One of the things that was brought up was the uh, inspection uh, fees can be directly paid by the renters. Is that true? No. Uh, no. As in the, the renter would be paying the inspection fee? Uh, the initial uh, inspection fee uh, was brought up that um, um, that could be put in uh, leases that they would pay the initial inspection when this was brought up earlier. Anything having to do with a lease? provision if something that for you and your legal counsel to discuss I, I don't know I can't give any advice about what you put in your lease if you're asking if the renter is going to be invoiced for the fees the answer would be no no I'm I'm saying as landlords you could have the renters pay all these fees that's a decision for you as a landlord and I would encourage you to just seek your own advice on that We're moving to online questions. First question is from um, Ms. Neithammer. If we have our furnace serviced every year, is that receipt from the uh, service and inspection of that good enough? Yes. Yeah, because they're, they're going to check it for CO as well. So if you hang on to that receipt when it comes time to do your registration, just provide it to us. They'll give you a form that says. It says everything's good, so yes. The, the, answer mic is working for some reason. the second question was uh, for uh, renters, if my heat goes out during the winter, uh, is that considered an emergency uh, that they have to fix within seven days? Yes. Any other questions? Coming back to the audience. Is there anyone that has not asked a question at this point before we start? I'm just curious as to how is this 100% outsourced in contract and after the first year, if it, we find that the surplus will it bring down the fees or? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a hybrid model between part city staff, part working with our consultants. Uh, Mr. Strong here, as well as I think Craig, your father, do, do a lot of our plan reviews for building permits. They also help us with other aspects. Carlisle Wartman, which is what CES is under, is our primary planning consultant. So items like our master plan are also worked through them. So that we have a long relationship with them that goes back, uh, I think, over 30 years at this point. Um, but yes, so it's it's designed to be cost neutral to the city. So it doesn't cost the city anything, uh, essentially. So we're, we're not losing money, but we're also not making any money off of this. It's similar to most of our building department practices. It's actually illegal for us to make money off of it. So in the event that we, are, we find that we're astronomically overcharging people, yes, we would roll over the fees. There's a... Yes, absolutely. I can print out any paper copies for any of the applications or any of the other forms. If you see me right after the meeting, I'll be happy to run copies for all of those. Yeah, I've been a, a state mechanical licensed contractor for 40 years and worked in nine different categories. My question to you is on this, uh, there's no way anybody could tell whether a heat exchanger had a crack in it 100%. No way. <clears throat> oh, well, do any tests? You can do any smoke test, anything? The only way you're going to know is if you care. And, and you may be correct, but they have equipment, and as you know, if, if it is correct, and they can sense that from the inspection, then. I'm 
then we know that. Right, exactly. Just with any inspection, just with any inspection that we go on, the building department, you know, there's, there's things that we just can't see. We're not going to be able to tell. Well, I'm thinking, but, why would I want to do these inspections <coughs> I said that heat exchanger wasn't cracked, which I didn't know that 100%, but you're told that you can't. You never know. And take that like liability. Well, and, and most of the inspections will say, you know, no CO detected. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a crack in the heat exchanger. It just means that we performed an inspection to the best of our ability, and we could not determine or we could not find any CO was leaking at the time. So if there's a small crack, and you're absolutely right, but, you know, we need to make the, do the due diligence to make sure that it's right. Yeah. To clarify that, then, why can't you just put a CO monitor next to the furnace and determine if the CO monitor doesn't go up? Why do I have to pay now another 150 to have a mechanical inspector come and tell me that there's no CO? It, they're going to do a more thorough inspection of the unit than what just is. It's not just about CO. It's, no, that's a yeah. whole different thing. Right. You're talking about CO. You want to see if the heat exchanger is cracked for CO. So if the CO monitor doesn't go off, there may be tons of things wrong with the furnace. Exactly. But if the CO monitor doesn't go off, that's the only thing that you're concerned about with that inspection. No, not, no, not necessarily. The, the inspection itself is to certify that the furnace as a whole is okay. And not necessarily just that, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not leaking CO at the time. Can I step in just for a second as a mechanical inspector for the city? So the CO we're talking about here, okay, is not the CO that's outside the unit. With a cracked heat exchanger, what happens, that takes the, the combustion gas from the furnace itself, blows it into the air that you then blow to the entire house. So just a CO monitor outside of your furnace won't register, any, register anything. So what the inspector is going to look for, he's going to do a test of the, the air that comes into your house and see if there's traces of CO in there. Now there's a certain LEL, which is a low limit, and obviously high limit is going to send everything off. But it may be, like Doug said over there, maybe a very minute crack that's not going to mean anything. The lower level is not going to hurt a thing. You know, the body can take so much CO2. All right, but... Um, what they're going to look for is completely different than the type of carbon monoxide. So you have them in your rooms because the furnace blows the air through the, through the furnace into each of the rooms, and that's why they're required in the rooms, especially at the sleeping rooms. Okay. I would like to speak. I have the mic, um, and then I'll let you have it back. So I just wanted to say in my air of complaints, I just want to be the face of a landlord. And... Um, I want everyone to understand the, that I don't, I'm not faulting any of you individuals or the people behind me or whoever's working for the city because it's not an individual. I understand you're just doing your job. It's probably really hard to sit here and listen to people angry with you, like you've specifically individually done something. I mean, you've only been working here for I don't know how many months. So I just want to express that first, but I also want to just express like as humanity becomes more and more complex, and there's more and more rules, and there's more and more fees, there's more and more inflation, um, and everybody's just trying to do their job. Um, th this, on a personal level, is just, when I got this letter, it's just heartbreaking as, as a human being that we're constantly being put under more and more and more rules. Many, many years ago, people left to come to this country for freedom and away from all of the oversight that's going on. Um, and we just have less and less than that. And anyways, the city of Saline, as far as like the homeowners go, we're paying, like I said, $7,000 in taxes on one little condo we own here in Saline. That's one third of the rent check that we get. Never mind insurance, all the things that we repair, things that we do. And we have eight children. I pay for their education, my husband and I. And we feel like the taxes alone just from the city are an undue burden on our family. And I want to put a face to that. Because I think that a lot of people think, oh, you own a rental house. Oh, they must have money. So we're going to give them a higher tax bracket because they own rental property. So I definitely feel there's a little bit of discrimination in that. And like this gentleman said behind me, this is going to end up causing renters to have to pay more money now as well. And likely because of this, I'm going to end up selling my condo because this is just one more added thing to the responsibilities in my life that I have every day. And every single person here has a lot every single day that they have to deal with. So I just wanted to say that I think the U.S. of A. is becoming a little too complex, especially the city of Saline. 
That's all. There's two over here, actually, Janet. I was just wondering if the city has uh, just because it's being recorded and some people might be able to hear the I question. I just want to know if the city has a list of the mechanical inspectors that we can go ahead and pay for if they negotiated some sort of price or, you know, because, you know, I don't I have no idea what it's going to cost, $85 probably. It's actually illegal by state law for the city to provide you a list of contractors because I would show preference to one. So if we didn't add somebody to the list, it would be exclusionary and then the city would be sued essentially by one of those contractors. So it has to be a heating and cooling HVAC person? Is Correct. That, yeah. So a licensed contractor. We can confirm yeah. the licensure of your of a contractor. So we have a list of 2,700 contractors that currently have done business in Saline. So we're happy to provide or check to make sure that they're licensed on your behalf as we would with any other project that you might undertake uh, with your rental or your personal property. And you can also go on the state of Michigan website and verify any professional license of that nature. Quick question. How expect they get one hour corrected house for all these violations? It's only one hour per house, correct? We generally will uh, set aside an hour for the actual physical inspection inside and out and the time it takes them to, to go through the software on their laptop and produce the report. Now it could vary, it could be more, it could be less depending on circumstances. That, right, that's what I was gonna say is it's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. to go through, climb up in the attic, climb in the crawl spaces and all this in one hour and you can barely get in the door and walk around the house in that one hour, mm -hmm. a lot of homes. So, and you're, you're doing that also for, let's say, Mill Valley, not Mill Valley, River Oaks down here? Yes. Which is a eight, 10 unit building? Yes. One hour? This I don't is understand not just, how this is done. Yeah, I don't mean to cut you off, but this is not the same as when you might hire a home inspector to do a, an inspection when you're transacting a property. Totally different. They're just looking for property maintenance code violations. They're not. They're not. You know, we're not coming in and saying, "Oh, you have coffee stains on the carpet; it has to be replaced." So knock a little money off the sale price. That's. We're not doing anything of the sort. It's just strictly code violations. Again, please do not just shout out questions. Um, it is being recorded, and the microphone is important to it. Just curious. The people that did show up, um, that got notices and did show up, um, we might be missing something here, I don't think so, but how was this a change that, that this was a good idea? Was there any landlord that ever showed up and said, I want you to come in and I want you to do, I mean, what, was it just compiled of people that aren't landlords? Because there isn't a landlord, I don't think, that would agree with these fees or anything and this oversight, but did just a committee that aren't landlords, did any landlord say anything that might lead us to believe that this was a good idea? Out of curiosity, how many of you own rental property in another city? Is Ann Arbor one of those cities, or Ypsilanti, or Pittsfield, or Milan, which all have it's a very common practice of municipalities to ensure that renters are living in safe and habitable conditions. And I know that it's not favorable towards landlords. It's why we, we preface that with this meeting that we know you're excited to be here, not really. So we understand, but it was a compilation of best practices, of tenant complaints, and of patterns of behavior within our own city that led us to this point. Uh, the mayor is also here tonight and said that he'd be happy to chat about, I guess he stepped out for a minute, but chat about how the process came to be and how this ordinance became formed. Finding something every time they went, and wow. um, I don't know if it's 
it's because of the student housing. You know, I have no idea, but this is our asset. We, we don't just mm -hmm. like borrow this house from somebody. Sure. If, if it gets screwed up, it's my asset that I'm losing. So mm -hmm. it is to my full advantage to get rent, and the only way I do it is to keep my place <coughs> in good working order. But we have neighbors that mm -hmm. aren't renters. It is a shambles. It is a crap hole. You know, and, and they have no oversight you know, over here. Um, so. I if have a I, question. If, if I if I may, just real quick, um, the owner occupied homes, the code enforcement department gets complaints constantly, and they respond to those, and they enforce the same property maintenance code at owner occupied homes. Now they're not going inside necessarily unless they're invited. Because it's not available for occupancy to the general public. That's a dip major difference. I, the I same as if you walk into a commercial retail store that's open to the general public, they have to abide by all the same safety codes so that the members of the public that choose to go in there are safe. My question is, I apologize, I arrived a little bit late due to a prior commitment, but and you may have covered this, but just out of curiosity, let's say in the last five years, how many complaints have you had of egregious conditions from renters? That I don't know. I, I have not been here for five years, so I don't have that data clearly on hand. Right, but we can pull reports on that, but I would say that the city council could also speak to the, the complaints they received directly, the complaints that we continue to follow through on uh, that, were, that were born before this ordinance, et cetera. I would be interested in the same information in that so far when we say, well, what kind of promoted or pushed the, the council to, to vote on this. Well, a lot of complaints. Well, how many? You give percentages on a lot of things. 20% complain about 20% of the landlords or is it 20% of the one person complains 20% of the time? So, you know, I, I'm interested in what the, and we had no notification of the council deciding this. So I am interested in why, other than money. And that information can definitely be shared with the public without question. These, this came about, we've had building collapses. We have had people injured. We have had people living in substandard conditions. I applaud you that you all have housing that is safe and, habit and, and habitable. Not all landlords are in that same you know, mindset. And so that's what we are looking at right now, is making sure. I think that that's a, that was an issue that Mr. Harrington brought up earlier in that we cannot just pick and choose where we are going to inspect. Oh, it's it's Okay. Are there any other questions at this time? Questions or comments? How many employees are you going to add to your crew to cover this? And how do they make each year? Uh, there will be zero staff employees added as a result of this. We recently hired a new building inspector to help with some additional administrative items. Uh, but Carlisle Wartman will be doing the inspecting. So there are no new staff members. It's a, uh, no, it's a consulting firm. So they pay, we pay them based on the inspection that they complete. I, I just want to say, uh, for those landlords that don't take care of their property where there's collapses, they're civilly and criminally liable. Everybody here that's a landlord, number one, you know how hard it is even to remove somebody from your property. The government protects the people that live in your property and they could be trash in your property and the government protects them. You know how difficult it is. And then also, the fact of your regulation and going in and inspecting everything, that doesn't guarantee that there are not gonna be a problem. How many times has government expect, inspected something and there's a failure anyway? So all this complexity that you're putting together, 
And people have reasonable requests. They're saying, hey, if there's a complaint, investigate. But don't make us go through all these hoops and jump through all these regulations and pay all these fees that are gonna be passed on to all the uh, residents and tenants here in Saline. People move to Saline to get away from the bureaucracy of large cities. That's why they're here. You're bringing the bureaucracy to the people here in Saline. That's why we're here. City of 10,000 people. We don't need big bureaucracy. Small police department, small inspection department, you get a complaint, you go check it out. If the, if the landlord's egregious, there's ways to handle that. You don't have to put all these people through that. These are all good people here. In Question. How many letters were sent out non-homestead? Approximately 350. Okay, and you've got, what, about 65, 70 people here represented that believe they have homes in, in good rental condition. So where are the, where are the rest of the people? Well, a lot of these people own more than one house, so you get three letters. Uh, I've been fielding calls all week about that, sir. So as Mr. Radzik said, the, the letters were sent out to anyone who had less than 100% principal resident exception, exemption, excuse me, or homestead. So there are examples of people who live in our community who are snowbirds who go to Florida and then claim, uh, you know, 50% there, 50% here, vice versa, who are letting their uh, their disabled family member live in their home, things like that. So they're not, they're not all real rental properties. Sometimes they're second homes. Interest of transparency, you knew that you had 370 that might or might not fit the bill homestead. Why weren't this group of people invited to the meetings to discuss this? Okay, you put it out on the city website. Not everybody, but you targeted everyone why we're here tonight. So you're targeting people that are homestead whether they are their own business, you could have invited them to the meeting, give them a heads up, this was coming last year during the discussion so we could have had some input. Very poor transparency on this. So the, I know you know this, I just want to state it, the group of people up here are not, we're not in a position to have this debate with you, we're not in a position to change that. The legislative action by council has taken place, it followed all of the public um, requirements for that type of thing. The reason this was scheduled and the reason the letters were sent out was an effort to reach the people who would be subject to these regulations to bring you in, to explain the process, the procedures, and to try to educate you on the code to give you uh, the best advantage to be successful in achieving code compliance to get certification as easy as possible. So that was the purpose of this evening. I hope we've achieved at least some of that. And like I said, I'm happy to stay as, as long as anyone wants to debate, but. And I'm happy to hear all of these opinions and viewpoints. It's very important, but as I said, we're none of us here are in a position to to change that at this point. That's yeah. That's out of my wheelhouse, so I would have to defer to others. We have a question in the audience, Mr. Randazzo, just a moment, please. So we have 11, so we have 11 days to get our um, information in to register. When will the first inspection be? If we need to go into the rental unit mm -hmm. and check off these 57 items that are on here and make sure that everything is in compliance, how long do we have from after that 11 day registration period to get to make sure that there's, the grass is gonna be less than six inches? I guess that's a two part question. So the first part is, um, in terms of the registration, the deadline is not a hard and fast deadline. So if it takes a little bit longer to get that information in for the registration, that's fine. Secondly, 
We, that, that's a request. We ask you to get that in so that we can start the process of sorting through them all, getting them entered into the software system, and then begin scheduling. We are required by ordinance to give uh, everyone at least 30 days notice of the first scheduled inspection. In terms of when your inspection would occur, and this would be the same answer for any of you, it will occur sometime over the next 24 months. What we intend to do is, in collaboration with the building department, we intend to go where they already know there are what, would, what they would consider to be serious problems at rental properties, and we would address them first based on known priorities. We don't know everything going on everywhere, obviously, but that's where we intend to start. So over time, you'll be getting a letter in the mail saying, hey, your first initial inspection is scheduled for this date. It could be 30 days out, it could be three months out. And if there's a problem, you just contact us and we'll work with you to find a suitable date. Is there, an appeal board? there is an appeal board for um, the code violations. And it's so if you get cited for a code violation and you don't believe it was correct, it's the same um, appeals board and process you would go through if you were under a building permit. It would be the city's construction board of appeals. Is that correct, Steve? Yes. So there's a process for appealing code enforcement interpretation decisions. In terms of appealing the actual adoption of the ordinance, that would be an issue to take up with the legislative body, which would be council. You mentioned that uh, exhaust fans and bathrooms will be inspected so that they're properly dust. And my, some of my units, you have to get into the attic through closet. Uh, the inspectors are going to bring the ladder to do that? We're, we're going to do, yeah. Back we're, I'll defer to Brent on that, but we're going to do the best we can to see what we can without being unnecessarily invasive and intrusive. But then that's not a thorough inspection. And to answer your question, sir, we're not going to be crawling around in attics. We're not going to be in crawl spaces, you know, the goal of this inspection is we're going to come through, we're going to do a thorough inspection, but we're just looking for, for violations. We're not we're not here to nickel and dime everybody. We, we want to make sure we have safe housing for, for your tenants, which you all do anyway. That's why you're here. But we're not, our goal is not to go in and find, we're not, we're not trying to write everybody a red tag. We just want to make sure we do a thorough inspection. But we're, no, we're not going to be in the attics. We're not going to be in crawl spaces. It's interesting, Doc, in here, then, because it says that you're going to go in the attic. And I know for a fact mm. that the attic access in the single rental is inside a closet. Mm -hmm. And she has it full of stuff. And of course, so she has to have it all cleaned out so that you can go into the attic because it says you're going to go into the attic. So why is it on here if we're not going to do it? And, and I appreciate you're not doing it, and she'll appreciate not having to clean the closet, but it's on here. So, you see what I'm saying? There's a dichotomy here. It's, it's contradictory. I mean, yes. We're not going to, there's other ways to determine it. If you've got, you know, you can, if a, if a bath fan is present, it's either going to be vented out a wall or it's going to be vented out a roof. So, as long as there's a termination somewhere, we can. Now, we can't tell if it's disconnected and laying in the attic like you saw in the picture, but we know at least that at some point it was then proper. And it, a lot of it made it, I'm sorry to cut you off, but some of it may determine on what we see elsewhere and what we're told by the tenant living there. If we see, you know, obviously a big, huge wet spot on the ceiling in the bathroom, we know that there's some kind of water intrusion coming from above, which would perhaps be cause for a little bit deeper investigation, where the tenant says, and I don't know what's up there, but it's there's there's something just scurrying around all the time at night. We tell that to the landlord first. The landlord or their agent should be there with us. Well, I mean, before the, before you guys get there, the wet ceiling. I tell mm -hmm. my kids, you see something, sure. and you call me right away. Well, I would hope that you all have that type of relationship with your tenants, where well, you would be out, you, you would be out ahead of it then. Mm-hmm. Well, like I said, we're, we're not in a position to change the ordinance at this point. We want you to be informed and educated on how this is going to go. Everyone here was sent a notice because they didn't claim 100% homestead. 
and the apartment, the commercial or properties that are apartment that complexes. Well, it, sir, if there was ever an instance in which we found that someone who had claimed 100% homestead is not actually living in the house but, but renting it out, that, that would be a cause for doing code enforcement then and that, write it. That's right. actually a violation of state law that is going to rise to a much higher level of prosecution. What, what, what is done to verify? And then the assessor has the right to go back and back charge three years worth of additional taxes. If we, you know, it's like anything else. Once you become aware of it, then you take action on it. But we're not out there looking for that. Hi. I live over 50 miles away. I have two condos here. Could or would they inspect them the same day? Sure, we could arrange that for you. And how do I tell somebody that? Or yeah, so like I said, we'll post our emails on the website, but if you have specific like specific cases or issues like that, we'd be happy to work with you on to make that. Our, our goal is we're not out to get you, we're not out to make your life as inconvenient as possible. We're really trying to work with you to ensure the safety and the ability of you. If you receive an inspection notification of a date and you get it on one and not the other, or you get them both but they're on different days, just call us okay. and we'll, we'll work with you on it. Gentleman in the back. You said that you're going to ask the building department of the buildings or that are in bad shape. Code violation right now, and the city should be pushing that to have those checked out. I believe there is a fair amount of. Um, uh, enforcement action going on under the building codes um, and I think some of the evidence is some of its anecdotal some of it is in plain view and observation so I don't want to sit here and throw out addresses and names but I know from what I we've been told that there's at least one commercial apartment community um, that is probably the f number one on their list and that's where we intend to probably go first unless something changes. And, and that's another thing. The building department hasn't done anything about that well, you're talking about. No, they have it, been. They have been active. Been working yeah. on it, but it's been sitting vacant for how long? And it's been it has cited, not, sir. We, 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 but where are, are we at a court deal with it now? Uh, yes. We are? Yes. Okay. I'm kind of kind of take your time up unrelated to this topic tonight. I inherited the title of landlord recently, and trying to find a definitive source information on when I can do repairs myself and when I need to use a licensed contractor. Is there a person I can talk to about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brent or Mr. Maciag, who's the building official in the back, he actually has cards. Uh, we're in the basement of this building, so anytime you want to stop by or if you want to give him a call or an email, he'd be happy to go through that specific case. Thank you. you. Uh, concerning, not concerning the apartments or commercially owned uh, uh, rentals, but people that have a private residence, how do you get past the uh, uh, private property and privacy that is afforded to Americans uh, by the Constitution of their own home? As I understand it right now, government is not allowed to enter the property or home unless there's an imminent danger or threat to somebody, but now you're talking about through regulation being able to go into residential homes. How do you get past the constitutional issue? The, the city has adopted a regulatory ordinance that requires this to occur. The same way the fire codes and other codes give the fire marshal or the building official for that matter the lawful right to walk into any commercial establishment anytime it's occupied or open to the public and do an inspection without notice. Yep, because there's a, a regulatory ordinance now that requires it. And 10th Amendment, 10th hmm? Amendment. 
Oh, I, I don't know about that, but yeah, I, I, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so I can't address that. I am. Would you, would you like and there's and there's quite honestly there's a lot of regulatory laws federal state and local that I don't agree with personally I mean I don't want to get stopped for speeding every time I'm doing 15 over on the freeway but I know it could happen I mean there's there's all kinds of things and I think part of the theory is when a rental housing is made available to the general public this is an effort to regulate that and ensure that it meets the bare minimum property maintenance requirements, not anything above and beyond, just meets the minimum. The same as that we do for all other commercial businesses. So how do you define available to the general public? Could rent to a friend. That's not general public. Well, so I'm not in a position to debate that, but it's available for someone other than the owner to live in. Because we have concern for the so tenant. Because we have. Mm -hmm. There's a constitutional issue here that you might have to face. In okay. Just, just uh, because there's concern for the, their, their well-being in a public sure. space, given the lease that this property will, did, and you're leasing it at your own risk. I think that would be it. I don't know if I'm not an attorney, so I can't give you a reaction to that. But I would encourage you to speak with a landlord-tenant attorney that knows that. That may not be legal. I don't know. <laughs> Right, so the ordinance clearly defines what we consider to be rent. So it's either payment or in either dollars, goods, or services rendered. So if you if you served son didn't do anything besides being your son, and you chose to let him live there, not paying your rent, not doing good services, etc., be a different case, and the ordinance would not necessarily apply to you. Kids can't pay you rent. But then you're a rental because I charge my kids rent after they turn 18. So now what? I think that's a specific case if, you're, if your children are living within your single home and you're charging them rent, that's a different case than this specific it's ordinance. It's not sure it's not written, it's not in the code. So you can make it whatever you want it to. I, I don't have a definitive answer for you at this moment, Mr. Randazzo, but I'd be happy to follow up with you on that specific case after this. I also want to just follow up. There were handouts tonight. If you did not get a copy of them, please see me and we will get additional copies made. Mr. Harrington, Mr. Razdick, our building officials all have business cards. If you need to follow up with them, please stop and see them. And if you'd like closing remarks at this time. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming, as painful as this may have been for you. I apologize that we are not in a position to engage in a more fruitful discussion about the actual legislative action that's already occurred. That's uh, for a different format at a different time and place. But I hope you've at least learned enough about the process and the code to know what to expect when we show up. Because we truly do want you to be successful and get certified with minimal amount of time and cost. And hopefully you'll all uh, earn that incentive bonus and you know we won't see you again for three years. <laughs> So thank you all for coming. Absolutely. How are you doing, guys? I don't know if I'm doing good. I am not. I'm actually.